get the slides? So I'm going to talk on simulation training for laparoscopic colon resection. Yeah, I have nothing to disclose. So the first laparoscopic colectomy was done in 1990 when I was an intern. And uh, the next issues that I saw in, in my training was all the issues of port site metastasis. And then there was a series of clinical trials that were done. To the colorectal surgeons in the audience, this is, is well known. In fact, as a resident, I went in the lab and I started to do some things with rodents, and we actually showed that we could increase tumor implantation at port sites threefold in an animal model. So these things were very concerning, except when you looked at surgeons who were really good at what they did, their tumor implantation rate was not higher. They had excellent skills. They had large experiences and expertise. And so the question was, what would it take to sort of get those same results across the board? Some of the data at that time showed that there was a learning curve. In other words, you need to do about 40 laparoscopic colectomies before you kind of got better and maybe could avoid some of those complications. However, when you looked at the training programs at the time, the colorectal surgeons in yellow were just getting just a few cases of laparoscopic colectomy. And in our residency programs, again, our residents were exposed to a few cases. They probably weren't getting the laparoscopic skills and the colorectal expertise that they needed for optimal training. Now, cadaver courses have been going on, and we, we just heard from Dr. Peter a little while ago that he had done 120 of these courses around the country, and yet for the individual learner, they might take just one or two, hardly enough to really claim that expertise to keep the complication rates lower. So one of the ideas we had uh, when I started uh, practice in 1997 was could you train outside of the OR? And we looked at a bunch of skills, laparoscopic skills, such as the ones seen here, and what we learned was we could put someone through a training program for a few weeks, 30 minutes a day, and get their skills up to par very fast, just like many of you can do in the learning center this week. And as you practice, your times will get better. But more importantly, when you go to the OR, in these particular cases were lab coli, you, your overall performance got better as compared to controls that did not train in the skills lab and that your use of assistance got better, that, you, you, that everything was much better technically in the OR. We looked at other devices such as MISVR systems, and these systems again showed improvement in the OR. So what we have is, is a way that we could at least practice and train and have improvement in the operative room setting. Now in our medical school at Harvard and, and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, we asked all of our residents to do these same tasks that we've shown show benefit to, again, make sure they have the laparoscopic skills as junior residents. And as senior residents, we start making sure they can suture laparoscopically easily. And by the f we want to introduce endoscopy, upper and lower endoscopy. And again, we have simulators that we can use to practice and hone those skills. Alter sound of many different, whether it's the FASC exam or transrectal, again, can be practiced in a skills lab setting over and over until you're comfortable with reading and using these technologies. SAGES, with the American College of Surgeons, has produced FLS. This is a validated exam, which we expect that our fourth year residents pass, and now the American Board of Surgery requires all of our graduates to, uh, in the country to pass before they can sit for their exams. It's not particularly hard. Technically, you have to do some endo looping, cutting circles, and tying knots and pegboards. But again, if these are skills you're not practicing, you may not have them. The American College of Surgeons and the APDS has developed a curriculum for residents, and the first two modules of which, uh, in phase one at least, is basic laparoscopy and advanced laparoscopy. So those of you who are residents, if you don't see this in your program right now, you, you will over the next couple of years. There's a phase two of the ACS APDS national resident curriculum. That looks at laparoscopic colon resection and laparoscopic appendectomy as one of the core procedures listed here that every resident must know. Now for colorectal surgery, there's a couple of models that are out there that you can gain skills with. One is the Haptica model by ProMIS 
And here you can actually put your hand in as a laparoscistic approach. There's something you can grab, you can, you can see it on the monitor and you can get feedback as you go. And I'd be surprised if they don't have this in the learning center this week. There's a virtual reality system too that you can use uh, that again allows you to practice doing key steps of key operations. And the learning center at Sages has featured these uh, both in their exhibits and in their learning center and I encourage all of you to drop by um, and participate. Our colorectal surgeon actually before she started doing the uh, single incision colectomies came down to the skills lab with one of the residents and inserted one of the one ports or the, a series of small incisions to really start practicing uh, the single incision colectomies. And now her experience is probably one of the largest in the countries. And the reason she was able to sort of jump ahead, she knew what she wanted to do and in the skills lab she was able to practice using technologies to accomplish the goals that she wanted to achieve. And again, it's a great way to go back even when you have the skills to refine your technique. Now what I've told you about so far is the use of simulators or models uh, to test or train your skills um, and that's really what surgeons have been doing for the last decade. Now our colleagues in anesthesia on the other hand have gone into a teamwork environment where they practice team skills, uh, bring people together to, and communicate to do a resuscitation. And very recently over the last couple of years we've, we've brought our anesthesiologists and surgeons together into what we call the mock operating room. This is an area for us to rethink all the things that we're trying to teach. We're not just talking about technical skills, there's a whole lot else that we want to teach our residents as part of the concept of surgical competence. One of the reasons for that is we know that in the operating room it's usually not a bleeder getting away that causes the adverse outcome. It may be a series of events that goes on. The circulator may be coming in and out of a room, there's someone new doing anesthesia, the new clip applier that wasn't applied right, a whole lot of things in a series that may have been stopped to prevent an adverse event. And therefore by training in teams we may be able to stop the line and let all of the providers in the room participate in the care of the patient. This brings us to the American College of Surgeons APDS phase three curriculum. This has to do with simulation and the ability of team training to take place. And again all three phases are part of the national resident curriculum being put forth this year. So in our own environment what we have is a mock OR. You come in and you greet the patient over in the upper hand corner. Uh, there's someone behind the glass window so you can talk to and interact with the mannequin. Then you scrub, go into an operating room that looks and feels very much like an operating room seen there. And then there's someone again behind the glass window who can manipulate pulse, blood pressure, the events that are going on in the room. And then afterwards you can look at the videotape, hear what you said and sort of break down the steps to say is that how you do it if you could do it all over again. And this is the concept of simulation. You see that looks like bleeding. This looks every bit as bleeding as that vessel that got away a little while ago on the screen but yet this is fake blood. We can look at technical evaluation in these teams. We can look at non-technical performance. And in fact in this mock OR you can see that in crisis there's a lot of things going on by a lot of different people. And when you can look at this picture wonder is the anesthesiologist talking to the surgeon? Is the surgeon talking to the scrub tech? And why wasn't that IV done long a time ago? Now kind of looking ahead at some of the things you're going to see in the near future, well comes back to FLS. In my environment in Boston our malpractice carrier Crico RMF who covers all of our Harvard hospitals has incentivized the FLS. They'll pay for our course, they pay for our voucher and they'll give us 500 bucks if we pass the test. <laughs> now I'm pretty sure the Boston Globe and Herald will soon announce if we don't accomplish these goals but the first is to try to do it with incentives from our malpractice carrier. Why? Because they think by having a the bar raise that all folks doing this surgery whether they're general surgeons, gynecologists or urologists will make for lower claims. 
And many of our hospitals, such as BIDMC in Cambridge and Mount Auburn, are now requiring our surgeons in practice to have FLS to keep their privileges and credentials. In 2010, SAGES is going to release fundamentals of endoscopic surgery. And I suspect this may very well be very similar to FLS. Um, and so those of us who are doing endoscopy will also need to take an online test and demonstrate our skills using a simulator. Our hospital was late but just bought into the robot. And already what we're doing at our institution is thinking, okay, now we have the robot. How can we start practicing in the skills lab so that all of our nurses, doctors who are using this device, who are in the room, can understand the technology and work together? Some of the new trainers that we have in our OR, or our mock OR, is the notes trainer. Uh, this was developed by one of our anesthesia residents, which basically puts a bunch of guts into a tub. Um, but as you can see, you can have the scope pass out the stomach. And uh, this is a device that um, allows you to think about how you might do operations. But it might also be the centerpiece, if you will, of doing simulation, where you have a gastroenterologist who's used to being captain of the ship and the surgeon who's used to running his own room work together in a crisis to try to figure out who's going to put out the fire, if you will. And in fact, SAGES in the Learning Center has a simulation based on notes. And so if you're working in the field of notes, you may want to bring your team up and practice doing some crisis scenarios. But advance <clears throat> means progress to something better and not progress to something new. And, and so all these things need to be not just adopted, but studied and proven to be beneficial. What I've shown you in a few minutes is a progression from looking at the box trainers such as FLS or the Top Gun competition that we'll have here in the exhibits and in the Learning Center, to partial trash trainers, such as the fundamentals of endoscopic surgery, to virtual workbenches to look at how to do colectomies, to the mock OR where you can start interacting, whether it be notes or laparoscopic crisis. Remember, the ultimate goal here is to decrease medical error and improve patient safety. Now, I got on the internet to see what ASCARS is doing as one of our cousin societies, and they actually have a symposium at their national meeting this year with SAGES, looking at acquiring, assessing skills in endoscopic surgery, and a special symposium on simulation in colon and rectal surgery. So again, I think this is coming uh, both in our, organ or in our own organization as well as in ASCARS. Well, in conclusion, Models, simulators, and simulation can train our students, residents, and faculty outside of the operating room. In the very, very near future, all surgeons will demonstrate skills on simulators, whether it be FLS or FES, and judgment within simulated safe environments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dan. Uh, are there any questions? So I understand you have uh, incorporated the FLS box into your curriculum. Have you incorporated other scenario trainings as well? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And those are mandatory. <laughs> Though they're not mandatory because we have an 80-hour work week. Yeah. So they're encouraged. Okay. Uh, if we mandate them, then we, then we go over the 80-hour work week. Strongly encouraged. Yes. Please. Well, I'm from Cody, Wyoming. Uh, so I'm a rural surgeon all by myself. Uh, taking call every night and this is great <laughs> if we were at Harvard or something of the sort. My, my question is, is, you know, what for us rural guys that are kind of out in the middle of nowhere getting time away and simulation and training and that kind of thing? Yeah, uh, um, what I can tell you is the American College of Surgeons has uh, 30 accredited education institutes. There's probably another 30 right now, so that's going to be 60 probably by the end of the month. Um, very soon, almost every medical school and major hospital center is going to have either a skills lab or a, a comprehensive education institute. In fact, for the residents in training, um, they have to have access to at least a basic skills lab in order to have a residency program. Um, so I'm not quite sure how far it would be for you to get to the nearest um, place, but I can tell you that at this meeting 
Um, we have many of these simulators. Uh, we have simulation. And all you have to do is go to the Learning Center and sign up and, 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 and give it a round. Uh, we have FLS testing. So if you don't have FLS, you could just go in the back there and, and take the online tests and take the proctored exam and, and get that behind you. Many insurance companies right now, I was talking to a guy at Stanford yesterday, are getting um, insurance premium discounts also for doing some of these patient safety initiatives. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, very Dan, much. very much.